Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. This episode, we're going to be talking about the book Baby Teeth by Zoya Stage. Did I say that right? I believe Zoya? you did, um, from the phonetical pronunciation on her Twitter bio. That's how much of a professional outfit we're running here. Livia actually went to her Twitter just to make sure that we were saying the, the name right. But also, I guess you kind of accidentally verified we said it wrong. Last episode, so we still don't win, but like at least we get the points for the effort, I think. To be fair, last week when we decided to review this was like mid-episode. I think we yeah. were looking at something <laughs> on Amazon, and I was like, hey, this looks interesting. So That's I don't true. think that part actually made it into the podcast, but yeah, so that was kind of a last-minute pop-in. Yeah. Hey, this is, I think, maybe tied for the shortest bio ever. That we've read so I can't tell you how excited I am about this. I'm going to dive right into it, and three seconds later, it'll be done. Uh, Zoya Stage is an author of suspense. Wait, oh, this is fucked up. I'm going to do this again. Oh, he already screwed up the shortest bio ever. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know how to... right, I just felt bad. I wanted to make it seem bigger. <laughs> I, I was thrown off. An author of dark and suspenseful novels, Zoya Stage lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Baby Teeth is her first novel. What Zoya and her publisher um, gave us in brevity for the bio <laughs> <laughs> did not carry over to the synopsis. So here is uh, here's the synopsis for Baby Teeth. A battle of wills between mother and daughter reveals the frailty and falsehood of familial bonds in award-winning playwright and filmmaker Zoya, Zoya Stage's tense novel of psychological suspense, Baby Teeth. Look at that. Do you see how they dropped part of the bio into the synopsis? So good. That's that might be brilliant on there. I'm taking back what I said about how great the bio was. <laughs> Afflicted with a chronic debilitating condition, Suzette Jensen knew having children would wreak havoc on her already fragile body. Nevertheless, she brought Hannah into the world, pleased and proud to start a family with her husband Alex. Estranged from her own mother, Suzette is determined to raise her beautiful daughter with the love, care, and support she was denied. But Hannah proves to be a difficult child. Now seven years old, she has yet to utter a word, despite being able to read and write. Defiant and antisocial, she refuses to behave in kindergarten classes, forcing Suzette to homeschool her. Resentful of her mother's rules and attentions, Hannah lashes out in anger, becoming more aggressive every day. The only time Hannah is truly happy is when she's with her father. To Alex, she's willful and precocious, but otherwise the perfect little girl doing what she's told. Suzette knows her clever and manipulative daughter doesn't love her. She can see the hatred and jealousy in her eyes. And as Hannah's subtle acts of cruelty threaten to tear her and Alex apart, Suzette fears her very life may be in grave danger. Dot, dot, dot. Is there Meaning they could have gone on for a, for a longer time, but they're going to assume you can figure out the rest. Well, you didn't... I didn't get to do my... The, the my uh, <laughs> a few good men moment properly. The grave dan- did you have you seen the movie A Few Good Men? Uh, I think I like when it first came out, like thirty years ago or whatever. So when uh, Tom Cruise is interrogating Jack Nicholson at the end, like there's a there's an interaction where he says like you said that he was in grave danger, right? And Jack Nicholson goes, "Is there another kind?" Uh, so nice. it was like per- it was perfect, but then you you you, yeah, you probably sorry. said something funny or over. Me quoting A Few Good Men. You can fix all that in editing. I'm not going to. All right. Yeah. Hey, I looked up Zoya Stage in IMDb. Oh, that's right, because of her film. Yeah, playwright stuff. stuff. Looks mm-hmm. like um, a director, writer, producer, actress, editor, cinematographer credits. This person, she's all over the map. But it looks like um, the majority of her work that's on I- credited in on IMDb was between like 06 and 09. We don't have super recent credits. So it looks like she may have made a change toward writing. We're here to find out if she made the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. I want to start off with saying this was, um, and I guess I could check now. This was the number one selling book in horror on Amazon a week ago when we selected it, which is really the reason we selected it. I mean, it's the reason I looked at it. Um, do we want to start with what we think about this as horror? Do we want to save that till the end? Uh, I want to start by saying that my my search for baby teeth on Amazon didn't get me really close to what we're t- <laughs> yeah what we're talking God, about right now. Kind of weird shit is popping up on Amazon. It, just a lot of baby 
um, like products, baby related products. Gotcha. Um, so wait, are we weighing in on whether we think this is horror or not? Um, yeah. Uh, I we can do that now, and I'm going to say strongly, yes. All right, I can see um, the horror in it. But I don't know, like, if I would have read this without thinking horror, if how long it would have taken me to get to horror. Like, there's probably, like, some other classifications I would have given this before I got to horror. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's a percentage you got into the book where you're like, all right, I can start to feel the horror. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a disconcerting book. <laughs> I just, like I said, I just don't know. How long it would be before I said horror if someone was asking me to categorize this? So would you, would you, were you originally leaning more toward like mystery or thriller or something like that? Or just I, straight I, up? So I would, so I would say thriller yeah. long before I said horror. Um, some of it like just kind of general literature. Right. Just straight um, literature. Probably family relationships. I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of stuff here before I'd actually get to horror. Yeah. Huh. Um, and hopefully the listeners will understand what I mean by that as we uh, as we get into the story. Well, our good friend Bob Pastorello always says it's it's all horror. It is all horror. <laughs> so it is. By the way, I don't know how I feel. So just to go back, I pulled up the Amazon bestseller list. Um, it has dropped to number nine. Um, but behind like a new Dean Koontz book and whatever, right? Yeah. But number five is something called Dan the Barbarian. That has like some cartoon characters. <laughs> it's a game lit heroin fantasy. So I guess I don't know. I don't know that Amazon really understands horror. That doesn't sound super horrific. But yeah, so and not to get ahead of ourselves, but uh, Dan the Barbarian, a game lit harem fantasy adventure, Gold Girls in Glory, book number one. Is uh, is also listed as horror. Maybe they're ironically listing it as horror because it's poorly written. <laughs> that could be. Although mm. it's got uh, four point three stars. I guess mm. maybe we'll maybe we'll circle back to this because this is <laughs> I guess kind of interesting. So <laughs> I gotta say though, like this is we're going into the third week since the release. So I gotta say that if you stay in the top ten, like a month out, that's probably pretty good. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean it's got 383 reviews on Amazon, which is uh which is a lot for for a few weeks. Heck yeah. So um yeah, the synopsis does a pretty good job of setting us up. We're introduced to Hannah and Suzette, and I say primarily the two of them because the chapters alternate all the way through with their uh view of what's going on in their life at any given time. Yeah, and specifically um it's we I just want to I just want to point out a very technical thing about this. They're written in a third-person perspective, but from the point of view of the person whose chapter perspective it is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's third-person, but it's from Suzette's perspective, or it's third-person from Hannah's perspective. Yep, which gives you um, the ability, a lot of insight into what's going on yeah. in, in these two people's heads, which is... I mean, it's the important part of the whole book. So Hannah, as mentioned in the synopsis, is now seven years old. She is, uh, I'm going to say, bright beyond her years. I mm -hmm. mean, like the things that she grasps and understands as a seven-year-old, uh, she's super, super smart, but has not uttered a word. Now, she's not mute. She can definitely make um, make sounds and stuff. She's just, uh, apparently, it would appear that she's choosing not to speak. And by choosing, I mean, there's nothing prohibiting her physically from speaking, um, we're dropped into their everyday life. Um, and by seven, she's been kicked out of a couple of schools for, right. I don't mean to laugh, but like the one she like set a garbage can on fire, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, and, and so she's, uh, she's, she's a kid who, um, doesn't take well to doing things that she doesn't want to do. I mean, she's essentially me, but she acts out more, right? She doesn't she's, want to... <laughs> she's essentially you with balls. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is that like, yeah. okay. <laughs> she's, she's me, but she's going to do something about it. I don't want to ever be around like I, I <laughs> and we're probably, I'm probably putting the horse a little before the cart, but like her reaction to like the common person is a lot like my inner kind of like assessment of, of the average person. Like there, I, I discover flaws very quickly in people I, I i disqualify them from like people that i want to interact with very very quickly so that's definitely what hannah was doing when she had to go to like schools and stuff like that for sure yeah 
she's uh, she's pretty happy in her day to day life as long as she's allowed to do the things she wants to do. And when I say that, I don't want to make her sound. It's not that she's bratty. It's just that she has a view of the way things should be. Um, and really what they should be is she's very happy with her dad. And although uh, mommy provides stuff for her, like food and care and stuff, she really could do without mom. Like, she's just not really thrilled about mom. She loves her dad. And uh, she feels that mom is getting in the way of that. Yeah. So and when we're introduced to the family in the beginning, uh, mom's a stay-at-home mom. So Suzette is the person who is at home all day. And because Hannah has been having trouble with school, Suzette also homeschools Hannah. So Suzette and Hannah basically spend all day, every day with each other. Alex is the person who goes out and goes to work. Um, and he owns his own, was it an architectural firm or something like that. And so he does the, the, the day job gig and comes home. And so he doesn't see a lot of, Hannah's behavior and Hannah definitely acts differently around him than she does Suzette. And so they've got this kind of weird separation where Suzette sees everything and understands like a fuller kind of, you know, spectrum of, of Hannah's behavior. Whereas Alex comes home and he's happy to see his family. He loves his daughter a lot. And Hannah basically becomes like this perfect angel of a, of a daughter whenever she's around him. So, that's one of the things that's that's causing a little bit of, of trouble in the book is that Alex only sees, like, the daughter that he always wanted, whereas Suzette sees, like, a bigger picture. And Suzette is not without her own issues. Um, it was mentioned in the synopsis, but she has a, a pretty much lifelong suffering of Crohn's disease, which I didn't know what it was. But I will tell you, if you want really details, uh, like real serious details yeah. on something that you don't want to know about, um, this book is not a bad way to get them. Yeah. Um, so so she suffers from some intestinal issues and she's had surgeries and it's uh, there's some pretty foul stuff happening. And I, uh, I I didn't know what it was before, but I will tell you now when I see like a TV commercial for medication for like Crohn's disease, like I have a newfound um, sympathy and respect for people that have to, uh, to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I would say like the structure of the book mostly takes place very, in a very short amount of time. Um, and it's all kind of in the present day. There's not like massive flashbacks, although there is like from time to time, a little bit of a flashback to like, referring to back to an incident that happened in a school that got Hannah removed from that school or something like that. But majority of it is, I mean, it felt like it take, took place over like the course of maybe a week to two, maybe three weeks on the long side. Um, yeah, the bulk of the book for sure. I would say within a month. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I, like on the surface, I'm kind of glad that we read this book without, like a lot of the, you know, the, the synopsis or whatever, because reading the synopsis, I do not find this to be a fascinating book. <laughs> I honestly read the synopsis and in my head, I was like, why did we pick this book? And I was like, it was the number one new book in horror. And let's yeah. face it. It has a great title. Baby teeth is an amazing title. Yep. This book, um, is an exploration in, parenting um the fear of failure uh, of parenting yep um the like maybe fam family the dynamics. mindset of a seven-year-old yeah. like you know i i don't know i mean I, it's hard to get in a seven-year-old's head right but so much of it felt very very genuine um the from you know uh suzette's you know through the course of the book her becoming more and more I don't know what the right word is. Um, separated, like emotionally separated from her daughter yeah. as the, the situation progresses and becomes worse and worse. I guess we should go back to the, the, the catalyst of that, right? So the catalyst is it's been difficult. But Hannah has gotten to an age and, and a realization that um, not only could she manipulate situations like between her mom and her dad by acting like the perfect little angel when Alex is home or getting out of school by uh, by being challenging um, for the teachers. But she's really decided that 
she doesn't need mommy anymore. That it would be better if it was just her and daddy. And she really um, ramps up the the behavior from I could annoy my way into or out of things to I am going to um, do what I can to ensure that mommy goes away and that could be just her and daddy. Yeah. And the neat thing is to kind of watch that um, evolution from the beginning of the book um, as it goes through the book. Because at the beginning you get hints that like she's mischievous, but it's not necessarily like um, you don't see the depth of it. Um, you know, it, it gradually kind of reveals itself. Because um, at the beginning, there's like they re- they reflect on, oh, it's um uh, the the mom and dad are uh, uh, Suzette and Alex are getting ready to go out to an event that they're dressing up for, and while Suzette's getting ready, she has her earrings laid out like on the, the, the side table by their bed or whatever. And Hannah thinks they're pretty, so she takes them when her mom's not looking, and she's got this, like, secret hiding place and a stuffed animal in her room that she puts them in. And then, you know, the mom, you know, Suzette's freaking out about it because they're, you know, they're very expensive, like, diamond earrings or whatever. But to Hannah, they were just, you know, sparkly and pretty. So that's, you know, that's all she cared about. But then after she saw her mom's reaction, she decides that she's going to flush them down the toilet because her mom cared so much about them so that like, you know, like she's just taking him away from her and that would be enough. Right. (laughs) But I mean, you know, I, I, I have a chance to spend time around young children from time to time and you see things and and you don't like, you don't want to categorize them in this way, but some of this exists in children. Right. Like they have jealousy and they can be um, sometimes I think they can be uh, mean without intending to like mm-hmm. they don't understand the the direction that their behavior is taking. They just know there's a result they want to achieve. And sometimes I think they don't understand it. But sometimes I think they can just be a little malicious. Yeah. And Hannah is definitely on the side of uh, she knows exactly what she's doing through the course of this book. Yeah. It's all very measured and calculated, um, even if it's calculated incorrectly sometimes but even then yeah she she course corrects like she recognizes the error and figures out how to not you know or how to 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 do it better next time yeah for sure and i don't think she necessarily understood the value of the earrings but she understood the value to her mother and that was the thing that was important um but insult injury she like pees in the (laughs) in the toilet before she flushes the earrings just to add a little stank on there yeah, I mean Hannah's <laughs> Hannah's a character you could really get behind, yeah. If you could support her cause, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. Let's flip this. Let's flip this around, and let's say that she the, that this story took place in a foster home where people are mean to her, right? Like, you would be very supportive of the things that Hannah does. Absolutely. You'd be like that kid. Good for her for peeing good on for those her. earrings before she flushed them. The problem is, is that Suzette is really the protagonist in this. And you're, yeah. you're, you know, at least my heart, and I would imagine yours, and anybody reads this kind of goes out to Suzette as she's trying to live with this uh, debilitating disease and, you know, trying to raise her kid. And I think everybody goes into having a kid thinking, oh, what a wonderful experience. I'm going to be able to nurture this child, and they're going to be super loving, and I'm going to love them. They're going to love me. Instead, you get a kid that whatever, you know, I think in the book was like past the age of three, really started developing a distance from from her mother, um, yeah. which is... is uh, must be super painful and it was definitely um that was delivered in the text of this book yep yeah and like you were saying about like real kids um it's obvious from even my very very limited interaction with kids but like also having at one point been a child they understand how to manipulate a situation to get what they want or to get out of trouble or whatever it happens to be um the added layer with hannah is that um She's obviously smarter, and so she she has the ability to plan for an outcome as opposed to just reacting to a situation in the moment, which is, if you ask me, when we saw from Hannah's perspective some of the things that she was planning, that was where you started to kind of get, like, the the hairs on your neck starting to raise up a little bit, because, like, it's it's almost an unnatural thing for, for a child of her age to start doing some of the planning kind of stuff that she was doing. Oh, for sure. And without giving too much of it um, away, just know that it it just gets worse and worse through the course of the book. So it starts with earrings. Yeah. um, But then becomes far more, um, 
you know mischievous uh, yeah. and dangerous really <laughs> and and your six you're, rays yeah but you're torn between it and as that like i said as it ratchets up on her end um suzanne you know has to react to all these things so you know it gets worse and worse for her and then you've got alex who's kind of a you know i mean he's really a tertiary character right like like he yeah. just pops in every now and then for a while i was thinking this is gonna be like that twist ending book where alex doesn't exist yep because for the first like 30 percent of it he's only mentioned but he's never actually like appeared so starting to get this this is all gonna be that you know this kid got fucked up when her dad died in an accident and you know that that kind that type of yeah, thing, like a like girl he, in the window kind of thing. Without spoiling a girl in the window, yes, that kind of thing. <laughs> to the point of like how, twist endings and stuff like that. I will say that um, the Zoya does a does a good job of of introducing enough questions to um to mate. Uh, throughout as I was reading the book, I wasn't really sure. Like there was a moment where I was like. You know, a couple times I questioned, well, what if what if this really is what if Hannah's the one that's innocent in all this? Although, like, you know, uh, some of the behavior that we mentioned may may not make her look super innocent. But you know what I'm saying? Like, what if the twist is that Hannah's, you know, uh, mm -hmm. cause is righteous? Um, what if Alex and Hannah are plotting against Suzette? Like I had those type. There was sure. enough kind of ambiguity where. Um, I had those types of thoughts, which was good too, because it kept you not like entirely in the dark, but, but guessing enough as the plot went on where it kept, it, it, it didn't make it super obvious where, where it was going to end up. I agree. I, uh, I'll be honest. I didn't know where it was going to end up until the last page. I mean, I went <laughs> through the whole, but you know, I mean, yeah. like seriously, I didn't know how this was going to, to close itself out. I don't know how much else we can really yeah. say about plot. Nothing really. Right. Um, characters, you know, just really phenomenal. I mean, the two, even Alex, uh, who's, you know, kind of adult and doesn't, I mean, he's not written that way, but that's kind of how I felt about him, right? Like he just doesn't, he just doesn't get it. Yeah. Um, that might even be a very real thing, um, that happens, um, well, to, he's, you know, a parent who's absent a lot, not absent a lot, but I mean, you know, he works and stuff and, and you've got the other parent who's there 24 hours a day. Yeah. He's seeing an incomplete picture. Yep. And he's, yeah. uh, you know, he's a little clueless and very disbelieving of reports from school, reports from mom. Um, you know, at one point, I don't want to give it away, something really big happens. And he's kind of doubting that, that it, right. it even occurred, you know, that it's, it's Suzette's imagination that that probably didn't happen. Um, you know, and, and it's a little bit about how their relationship um evolves slash devolves over all of this too but really the the guts of this is this fucking kid man this hannah she's yeah. uh she's something else yeah that's that's the character that made the book and and if you're worried about a book that is half from the perspective of a seven-year-old girl i will say that probably the best stuff in the book is the hannah chapters um not to say that the suzette chapters aren't great because they are but um, her chapters are a little bit more foundational, whereas Hannah's chapters are much more, um, I guess, character driven, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like the Suzette chapters are where like all the this is what we got to do in reaction to these situations, things, whereas Hannah's is just purely like the Hannah perspective of things, which was um, where a lot of just, well, fucked up, really interesting, entertaining stuff happened. Well, and she's maybe a tad overwritten. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. she's super suit. She's smart far beyond seven. If this kid was 12, I'd be questioning some of mm -hmm. um, some of it. But where it's written like omnipotent, you know, third person. Um, maybe it's a maybe it's a little maybe, maybe it's OK. But God damn it, man. I mean, that's where all the best lines are delivered. I mean, from yeah. like a quotable standpoint, I mean that that's really where all the chills come from and stuff oh is definitely God. in the Hannah chapters. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but honestly, like, there's there's not much more we can say about the book. I think um, it is very conspicuously small on characters, and I think that's the point. Is like, for the majority of the book, you're experiencing the lives of these three people, and they interact with a handful of people throughout the book, but not in a significant enough way 
to even really mention them. And anybody that we would mention may comes up, you know, past the point of, of spoiling. So, like, really, this book is three people. Agreed. I was just looking through some of my um, notes and stuff. And, man, the writing is really, really exceptional. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. That's it. That's, I don't, that wasn't <laughs> contributing to any conversation. I'm just, again, <laughs> wowed at, at how some of this was written. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's go over to our Patreon and uh, and do spoiler talk. We'll come back. Maybe I'll throw out a few quotes. Yeah. Um, for anybody not familiar, I don't know how you could not be at this point. Uh, Patreon.com slash booked. Uh, $1 a month gets you access to spoiler talk, which is where we uh, talk about the end of this book and maybe some stuff in the middle that we didn't want to talk about here. Uh, more and more nowadays we're doing these for books uh, we skipped our last book because it was two short stories totaling like 30 pages there wasn't a lot to to talk about from a spoiler standpoint but it's something we have fun doing and uh very recently gave me a new perspective on a book and we'll see if that happens again um so uh stay tuned we'll be right back in like two seconds and just like that we're back um good spoiler talk rob and i are on the same page about some things um mostly everything i think uh and we're not going to talk about it here because it's super spoilery yeah I, uh, as I was going through looking at my notes while we were doing spoiler talk, I do have a couple of quotes I want to share. And I think that they're, um, they're important. I want to like contrast a couple of them. So I'm going to read the good one first. Like this is very, um, very touching. Uh, at one point, um, uh, Hannah is, uh, he, he goes to give, he, or, um, Alex goes to give Hannah a hug. Her dad gives, gives her a hug and he says, love you, love you so much. And the, the quote is, she hugged him back and raised the volume on her pitter-patter heart so he could hear her love. Jesus Christ. Right? Like this kid, like she's that sweet. She loves her dad that much. Um, there's a scene earlier where I'm, it's not really a spoiler, but it's one of the um, it's one of the times she was kicked out of school. She takes... Uh, there's a kid in the school whose parents want her to be able to drink um, like Kool-Aid, high C, whatever it is, you know, when she wants to. Mm -hmm. um, but she basically has to take her lunch by herself because, you know, other parents don't want their kids to whatever. So there's this whole thing. Well, Hannah doesn't like this kid. <laughs> she doesn't like any kids. So at one point they're painting one day and she has the idea that if she takes some paint and puts it in a cup with a little bit of water. She can get it to look like Kool-Aid. And has this girl drink it and has this girl drink paint, which is hilarious and terrifying, right? <laughs> but here is uh, here's the kicker. This is the line. Hannah smiled, thinking of a better trick with crushed pieces of glass. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so this is the same kid who raised the volume on her pitter batter heart so her dad can hear the love is thinking of like, I use paint, but maybe I should have used crushed pieces of glass for this little bitch to drink. <laughs> I think I'm just going to react to every quote you give with Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's the the contrast um, between the Hannah that you that you really feel for, yep. um, and, and the Hannah that you're 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 terrified of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you have others? under slumber bumble beast? I know that's for people over <laughs> Patreon, but we're trying to think of the name of her. Uh, uh, you know, her, her imaginary friend type thing under slumber, bumble beast under slender under slump. I'm not going to try it. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, what do you feel about some wrap ups? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and knock this one up? Like I just came up with the idea for this episode. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Livius was, uh, was excited about this book mostly because I think entirely because it was a chart topper. Um, but, uh, re reading, the synopsis, I was like, all right, yeah, sounds good. I'm, I'm down. And um, I want to say that I read like the first 10%, and then I and I had like a three-day gap before I read the rest of it. And it's absolutely not because I wasn't interested. Within the first like f two chapters of the book, I was like, I'm totally sold on this story. It, 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 it brings you in from the absolute start, and it doesn't let up. The only reason there was a three-day gap is because... Of work, so I just didn't have time. That being said, I finished the book in two sittings. Well, the first sitting, obviously, was that one 10% gap, and then the other 90% I read in one straight shot, and um, it was really... It was gripping. It kept me in there. There's a lot of ups and downs, and the fact 
that we have a girl who doesn't speak is absolutely used very well to build up tension, but also build up emotion in this book. And I'm going to keep it as vague as that, but the fact that we have a, a, a voluntarily mute child is a very effective tool for, for working on you your, your mind when you're reading this book. I'm not going to go super elaborate into details. I'm just going to say this book is incredibly written. The characters are amazing, and the story is incredibly entertaining. And there are points in the story where I cried like a total bitch. It's that good. Five stars. Bitch tears were in abundance um, for the book team on this uh, in this book. Um, I, I don't I don't know what Rob looks like when he cries when he's reading a book. I mean, I have a picture in my head. Just imagine water you. running down. Like I look the same, but just like with tears in, in my face. I had uh, in, in a part that really affected me. I was at work. So now picture that I'm standing with my uh, Kindle propped up on a stack of pallets. <laughs> okay. And I'm vaping, like just furiously vaping, right? There's just vapor everywhere. It looks like a fog machine is going off. And I'm like, I can't actually fucking cry. Like I have to fight back these tears in my eyes because fuck, I'm at work and I'm an adult man reading a fucking book. <clears throat> So no tears rolled down my cheek, but it had I have been at home or maybe sitting in my car or somewhere else, it probably would have been waterworks. Um, I'm going to keep the talking vaping. while Rob is oh my God. Trying, to, trying to breathe. Um, yeah, everything Rob said is 100% true. Um, Zoya Stage is likely um, a name that we'll be hearing a lot over the course of the next few years should she continue to um, craft fiction like this. Uh, for me, this is 100% unique in its scope. Um, I was totally bought into to both characters. Um, like I said, the two characters whose points of view we see, and, and even the Alex, the the, the father, um, he, he limited use in the book, right? I mean, he's uh, he's probably more of a storytelling tool than he is a, a character. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say that this is uh, this is the best book I've read this year, and I'm not gonna go through the list. We've read a lot, a lot of books, but this is probably in the top five for me of books that we've reviewed, which is saying um, a lot. And I'm gonna leave that as my uh, as my wrap up. Um, this book is five plus stars for sure. I think that's the only time in there's only one other time in, in booked history where you even joked about going above the five star scale. I'm I'm dead serious. I don't want I'm not going to go through the list and try to like force rank it against other right. brilliant books, but it's easily in the top five yeah. books we reviewed and the best book this year. I actually looked at the list of books we reviewed this year and there's been some great books. This is on a whole different level. It really fucking came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing. Like, I really, I really wish that everybody was listening had had I, that we knew that they read it because I just want to, you know, that spoiler talk was huge. But like, I want to go on about the stuff we can't talk about. But yeah, yeah, it was it was great. So I, I uh, definitely, you know, we were talking for a while about um, um, what was it like, like pre-approved authors, like they're authors that just the book's coming out. Like we don't need to know what it is. We yeah. don't need to have synopsis. We don't, whatever. Zoya stage is, is definitely that um, for, for me and for, for this podcast, I imagine. Is she the new Megan Abbott? She might be the new Megan Abbott, man. And you know, that's the whole thing. We haven't classically reviewed a lot of books by women and it might be because we're sexist. Yeah, it I don't might know if that's the be, thing. Yeah, it might also just be because we're not like the, the circles that we travel in. You know, I say that like we're some kind right. of hot shots or whatever are, are kind of <laughs> littered with with men. Um, but man, Megan Abbott's uh, book. What was that? Hold my hand. What Give me your called? hand. Give me your hand. And this this close together. I mean, luckily we had a we had, we had Ford Fairley to break them up. Right. Because <laughs> fuck, man. We had to get a little like chauvinism in there somewhere. But I mean, <sighs> well, not, yeah, not, yeah, we. Yeah, <laughs> not too yeah, long we ago. had to talk about Ford Fairlane for half an hour on the last <laughs> podcast just to wash the wash the girly stuff off of us. Right. No, this was absolutely amazing. Um, I do. I did make a note. Uh, I know we have some listeners in the UK. Um, by the time you're hearing this, essentially, this book will be out in the UK, but it's called Bad Apple. So don't look huh. for baby teeth. Um, Zoya Stage posted on her Twitter 
um, just a couple of days ago down the 9th of August. Um, she posted a big stack of books, but in the UK it's called Bad Apple. Maybe I'll put that parenthetically in the in the title mm-hmm. so that, you know, people will maybe it'll be easier for them. Baby Teeth is still a great title, too. I mean, what's not great about this book? Like, Honestly. just what? Just Yeah. We didn't even talk about all the Swedish stuff, which I imagine might be. Um, I'm just taking a stab with a name like Zoya. That might have been autobiographical. Her personal heritage. Probably. Yeah. 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 So looking at our list of books this year, Zoya Stage, you got Megan Abbott. Not not just a few few books before that was Marisha, Marisha Pessels, uh, Never World Wake. Mm-hmm. Yep. Another author that we've that's our second book that we read from her. Going all the way back to uh, what the fifties, Carolyn Keene, The Secret yeah. of the Old Clock. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but that wasn't was that? Oh, we did determine that was written by. It was by an, a, actually a woman author. Yeah. 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 So yeah, we're. I mean, I feel like twenty eighteen is shaping up to be. A lot more um, equal in genders. Yep, that's uh, we're becoming more diverse. There you go. In our reviews, but we've got but, a lot of like I, I would say that like of the mainstay authors that we have, I, I it's easy to pull female names like Alyssa Nutting was sure. one that we did last year too. So it's not like yeah, I, I think we're fine. Yeah, and we got a lot of love for like Amanda Gowan and. Stuff like that. And we really sound like we're rationalizing at this point, yeah. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this yeah. shit off no, here. I got, Rob. It's okay. I got black friends. <laughs> oh, my God. It's cool. Next week, we will not be reviewing a book because <laughs> Rob, World Traveler Rob, will be out traveling. The world. Do you want to talk about what you're doing? Um, yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll vaguely talk about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, me and Ryan, the, quote, marketing intern, unquote, um, are doing a road trip to Austin, Texas for about three days um, to to attend an event that is work-related, kind of. So I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to remain intentionally vague about that. Um, so, yeah, it's a little road trip down to Austin. And we uh, <laughs> we we got a Airbnb. I don't know. if Did I tell you about the Airbnb? You did, but I totally think you should tell the listeners. All right. So uh, our Airbnb is... Um, Star Wars themed. So it's a two bedroom, two bathroom, like little house, um, about, I think 10, 10 minutes drive from downtown Austin. Um, if anybody wants to check it out, it's in Austin, Texas, the Crestview fandom B and B. And, um, like both bedrooms have like, like Star Wars comforters and sheets. And there's like posters on the wall and like, like glass cases with like figures and stuff inside of them. So it's like totally, uh, nerd heavy. So we're going to be doing that. And, um, so I'll be away for, I think the total thing is about six days. So it's going to be difficult to, uh, to get any reading done, but we'll still have it. I think we're going to still have an interlude episode up kind of in a timely fashion. Um, yes, we will. And then it'll probably be an interlude episode and then followed by a Facebook Live. We're still working the details out on that, but it might be a few weeks before you get a book. But man, we've just been pouring books down uh, on, on you guys. And it's really going to be, we probably need the distance because I got to tell you, I don't know what I'd have to pick up tomorrow after reading this book. Yeah, that's um, true. So now that we've addressed the next couple episodes, anything you want to talk about before we uh, we get on with our evenings? Oh, we already talked about my our, my travel plans. We talked about you vaping and crying. I don't. I, I can't think of anything else that's going on in our lives that's significant enough. I avoided. Okay, so I will say I'll tell you a little bit. Um, uh, b- for work, I was I was working down in the like the Loop. Uh, for in Chicago, I was in downtown Chicago. For people who aren't from Chicago, uh, working Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, which typically would be fine. It's it's you know it's pretty far away from where I live, but whatever. But this particular week week weekend or weekend, I guess depending on how you think of it, uh, was Wallapalooza. So I don't. God, I'm trying to think if there was ever a time I even wanted to go to Lollapalooza. I was never a festival dude. Mm-hmm. Like I'd gone to some of those like day long concerts, but like I, I can't imagine spending the four hundred fifty dollars for like the whole Lala. And and come and like uh, yeah, I just can't imagine doing it. But um, I, so I was near like that took place at Lollapalooza took place at Grant Park, and I was probably like four or five blocks north is where I was working. Um, for all you sleuths out there that might help you figure out where I work, 
Um, but the reason I bring this up is, uh, like, so we you know, take a break for lunch, and I go out to like some place along Michigan Avenue somewhere um, to 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 get food. And there's all these like girls and dudes, obviously, but the girls who were going to the Lollapalooza concert, you could you could tell because they are like head to toe covered in glitter with like the skimpiest outfits. I didn't know glitter was a thing. I mean, I know it exists. Um, <laughs> What's this I, glitter like, you speak of? Yeah, I just I didn't know that. Like, is that is that a new trend? Well, so um, another th- so one thing I discovered over this weekend was. I'm old. Like I was, there's a lot of people that I was working with who are significantly younger. Like I brought up, um, <laughs> at one point the actor, David Schwimmer and people are like, who's that? <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm an old man. <laughs> um, someone mentioned post Malone and I was like, I don't know any songs by post Malone. So like there's, there was like a, a generational gap. I'm hanging out with all these people at lunch and, and there's like girls literally like in, um, like bikinis, and like any bare skin is covered in like multicolored glitter and stuff. And so I asked, I was like, where does Lollapalooza fall on the glitter scale? Like, is every festival like this just like you're you're pacing yourself in glitter, or are there like some more glitter than others? And apparently Lala is kind of like middle of the road glitter. Um some of the more like electronic music stuff, oh, like yeah. like the EDM. Is it EDM? Mm-hmm. Or is that the ASMR? No, I'm just kidding. No, no, that's yeah, no, it's EDM. Um, the EDM, like those, are, are like a glitter bomb. So, um, but yeah, I oh saw a lot God. of like, I saw a lot of like very underdressed women walking the streets of like um, the Magnificent Mile, Michigan Avenue, which is like like all these high end stores and stuff. It's like Cartier and Tiffany's and. Burberry and stuff like that, and like you've got this girl with like seventy five percent of her ass hanging out of whatever she's wearing. It was a very interesting, weird weekend that I was not prepared for. I'm gonna, you know, talk about the the creepy old man syndrome. Because see, when you get to be our age, I'm gonna put <laughs> us in the same age group for a minute. Like, if we yeah. see glitter, we just think stripper. Like that's all we're thinking, <laughs> right? I mean, that's that was in my youth. That's who wore the glitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like um. Like three-year-olds and strippers. Yeah, that's who, yeah. Because it's in your glue or it's part of your costume for your, your stripping. <laughs> yeah, so, so that was that was my weird weekend. Very cool. Um, I mean, I know you had to work a lot, but that had to be a sight to behold. Glittering um, Lollapalooza <laughs> fans. The only festival I ever want to go to is Riot Fest and no one will go with me. So that's it. That's all I've got on festivals. That's not... Yeah, that's all I yeah. have. Yeah. yeah, musically, that's the only festival that's really attractive to me. I guess, I guess the Warp Tour ended this year. Like, there, this is their oh, last like year. Stopped. I don't know if it's still going on. Yeah, mm. I went and saw. I think it was the second Warp Tour. That was the only time I was ever at like a day long festival thing. Yeah, I did. I did that a few times, mostly because friends wanted to go when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, never really was my thing. But that's where I turned down an autograph from Moby. Did I tell you about that? Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, you should tell the <laughs> listeners, but yes. Well, I mean, there's not much of a story, but, like, we were at this, like, kind of all-day festival, and, and um, my I was, the friend I was with lined up because he wanted to get Moby's autograph, and so I just, I was in, I didn't have anything else to do, so I was in line with him. And we get to the fucking front of the line, and he's doing these, like, little cute drawings for whatever he's signing for people, and I'm standing next to my friend, I'm, like, behind my friend in line, <laughs> and so he finishes signing my friend's thing and so he ought naturally looks to me because i'm the next in line and i was like i'm good <laughs> poor moby he's probably still thinking about that i mean now that he's not like a top name anymore <laughs> see now this is this is what you're talking about younger listeners would be like who the fuck's moby yeah, who's moby yeah so he's got a, you know, what does he do like mu- like music for movies or something yeah, uh, yeah. i he, remember yeah. when we went to the comic-con do you remember when we went with with was it with ryan <laughs> with ryan like three years ago <laughs> Uh, Were you there yeah. when I had that real awkward interaction with the cosplay girl where she thought I wanted an autograph? <laughs> this is and I was like familiar. genuine, genuine Livius full force where by the time like we we're done interacting, she was like looked really depressed. Cause, like, <laughs> I don't know. I remember what I said to her, but I remember thinking like, oh, that's another one's going to have a goddamn brain aneurysm. I'm going to read about in the paper in a couple days. You really know how to destroy women's bodies. Oh, God, man. 
I said bodies anyway. because you specifically right. affected someone's eye. I, I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's it. That's Rob and I should not go to music festivals or be around celebrities, <laughs> apparently, or women who want to have a conversation. Or, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's, it's that not disqualifies looking good. most people. Yeah. yeah that, and you know what? Honest, Rob, you know me real well. I'm okay with all of that. Yeah, that's pretty much where you're at in life. Yeah. So, yeah. It works so. Out. Um, yeah, so at any rate, have a good uh, have a good trip. I mean, listeners are going to get an episode, um, but uh, it feels like, I don't know, like it's weird because I, I know we're going to do an episode, Yeah. but I feel like we're already talking about, I don't know, you're going to have to have Hopefully nothing stuff. significant happens between when we record the episode and when we post it, like, yeah. Correct. Because then we'd so, look stupid. Yep. Um, but take the take the next uh, two weeks and uh, get yourself a copy of Baby Teeth or Bad Apple, depending on where you're at in the world. I really think that everybody should read this. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this um, very enthusiastic review of Baby Teeth. Until next time, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Keep reading.